Okay, so uh, I wanted to do something special today. I wanted to give a, a class about Rosh Hashanah. So we're going to veer off a little bit from what we were doing. And what was in my mind, when I think about Rosh Hashanah, I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm confused. If on Rosh Hashanah, I'm supposed to be happy because we have all these beautiful meals and this, you know, there's good company and we drink wine, right? We have all these very nice, happy kinds of ceremonies that we do. And on the other hand, we're in shul and we hear the chauffeur and there's a very strong tug. It's a day of scrutiny, right? It's the Yom HaDin, the day of judgment. And there's an element of constantly thinking about and being concerned my year is going to be determined on this day so where does that leave me emotionally you know it's hard to know sometimes because like i said there's on one hand we have this happy part of it on the other hand we have a fearful almost scary and perhaps crying kind of feeling how we're relating to Hashem so you have emotions on two different sides of the spectrum and I wanted to talk about that and look look at uh, some of the possibilities from the sources about how we're supposed to feel on Rosh Hashanah and where is it getting to us where is it leading us really so the first source that I gave you if everyone has a, a source sheet. Okay, the first source that I gave you is... Yeah, it's getting passed around. It's from the book of Nehemiah. Okay, so um, at the beginning of the Second Temple era, when the Jews came back from Babylon, okay, so they weren't they weren't doing so well those jews who came back were like a ragtag group of of people and they were involved in lots of different kinds of averot lots of different kinds of sins and um then it's the day of rosh hashanah at this time and we're just going to read it in the english i'll do it because it's a little bit quicker here is the description of their rosh hashanah the entire people assembled as one man in the square before the water gate, and they asked Ezra the scribe to bring the scroll of the teaching of Moses with which the Lord had charged Israel. On the first day of the seventh month, Rosh Hashanah, Ezra the priest brought the teaching before the congregation, men and women and all who could listen with understanding. He read from it, facing the square before the water gate from the first light until midday to the men and the women and those who could understand the ears of all the people were given to the scroll of the teaching Ezra the scribe stood upon a wooden tower made for the purpose and beside him stood Matitya, Shema, Aniya, Uriah, Chilkiya, Maasiya at his right and at his left Pideya, Mishal, Malchiya, Ashum, Hashpadana, Zacharia, Mishulam very interesting names Ezra opened the scroll in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. As he opened it, all the people stood up. Think about what this reminds you of, this scene. When you hear this description, what does it remind you of? What does it sound a little bit like? Inauguration. Okay, but Moshe, when? Yeah, kind of a little bit like our Sinai. Shades of that people are standing he's up high right Ezra blessed the Lord the great God and all the people answered amen amen with hands upraised then they bowed their heads and prostrated themselves before the Lord with their faces to the ground Jeshua Bani Shariba Yamin Akub Shabtai Hodiyam Asiyah Kelita Azayah Jozabad Hanan Peliyah and the Levites explained the teaching to the people while the people stood in their places they read from the scroll of the teaching of God, translating it and giving the sense so they understood the reading. Nehemiah the Tashita, Ezra the priest, priest and scribe, and the Levites who were explaining to the people said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. You must not mourn or weep, for all the people were weeping. 
as they listened to the words of the teaching. He further said to them, Go, eat choice foods and drink sweet drinks and send portions to whoever has nothing prepared for the day is holy to our Lord. Do not be sad for your rejoicing in the Lord is the source of your strength. Now this is a message that was given to the people. How were the people responding on Rosh Hashanah? Very sad because there was a realization, apparently there was a realization of where they were holding spiritually, right? And they feel it. And then what does he say to them? Stop, stop on this day. You cannot have Avelut. You cannot have mourning on this day. What are you supposed to do on this day? Tells them to eat good stuff, right? Go out, make beautiful roast turkeys, make uh, you know wonderful drinks and desserts. Do not be sad. You must rejoice on this day. Now certainly Nehemiah and Ezra weren't telling them, stop, just to go out and have a good time, hit the town. That's certainly not the meaning of Rosh Hashanah. So we can't take it that way. On the other hand, we are being given a view about what our, where our heads are supposed to be on this day. Well, why, are, why are they telling the people that you should be happy? And he gives the big clue at the last phrase of, the, of what he says. Your rejoicing in the Lord is the source of your strength. So I want you to keep that in mind, okay? Then if you turn the page, we're going to look at some other sources that also very, very uh, important sources. I know that there's a lot of Hebrew here, so I'm going to translate it. So don't worry about that. But they're important sources for us to get a sense of what did our greats, what did our Rabbanim say about how we're supposed to feel on Rosh Hashanah. Okay? So, source two. The Rosh Hashanah. Ein ma'arichin b'tfila yoter midai. She'ein lehitanoto ad chatzot. What are we being told here by the Vilna Gaon? We're being told that on Rosh Hashanah, you're not supposed to dive in to the point where you would be considered fasting. You shouldn't go beyond a certain time in the middle of the day. And you'll notice that in certain shuls, when they have very, very lengthy davening, they often stop at a certain point and they make a kiddush because you're not allowed to fast on Rosh Hashanah. The ain live kot be Rosh Hashanah. And the Vilna Gaon says, you're not supposed to cry. Kimuvoar be Ezra. He quotes our source that we just read. Al tifku. V'hikpid lefamim lenagen hakadish she'achar musaf lechvod yom tov. And there was a certain, um, uh, a certain tradition that people were mocking, people w- would be strict on this, that they would sing in very beautiful melodies, they would sing the Kaddish that we say at the end of, M- of Musaf, and you'll notice this in the shuls that you go to. It's like a very happy tune. The last thing that we end with ends on a very happy tune, so you walk away from the davening in a good mood. The Shulchan Aruch about this topic. Ochlim v'shoti musmechim. What are we supposed to do on Rosh Hashanah? We eat, we drink, we're happy. Ve'ein mitanim b'Rosh Hashanah, v'lo b'Shabbat Shuva. And you are not allowed to fast on this day. Somebody might think, I'm going to be such a firm person, I'll be so religious, I'll fast. Not only Yom Kippur, I'll fast on Rosh Hashanah. No, Asur. And you're not allowed to fast on Shabbat Shuva, the Shabbos in between. Amlam, but, and here we get a little bit sense of something more serious going on here. Lo yachlu kol sava'am, but you shouldn't eat till you're stuffed. So we're not having a sense of eating, just this eating orgy. Laman lo yakelu rosham, because we don't want you to get lightheaded. Don't want you to get like away from the real meaning of the day. V'tiyeh yirat Hashem al and here the Shulchan Aruch tells us what should be in front of us? Yiras Hashem. What is Yiras Hashem? Yes, a reverence, a, a awareness about the greatness of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So I'm going through a few different things. I'm eating beautiful meals. 
I'm singing, I'm using the melodies which are so uplifting. I'm not allowed to fast. I'm not allowed to be, to, to be in Avelut. Yes, but at the same time, I have to have this reverence in front of me. This Yiras Hashem. Do you know what we say every time a person makes a bracha? Every single time you make a bracha, you are becoming more able to have Yirat Hashem. To have this reverence and fear of Hashem. Because you recognize who Hashem is. How much He gave you. So if you want to know, how do I get to a place where I have this feeling about Hashem? Say brachos and concentrate on them. Okay? The Mishnah Brura. He goes on and he says, Ochlim, Vishotim, Vismechim. We eat, we drink, and we're happy. Rotzel Omar, Afshahu Yomadin, Mikol Makom, Mitzvah Shel, Vishamachta Bichagecha, Shayach Dam Bo. Shagam Hu, Bo, Shagam Hu Bichlal Chag. We eat, we drink, we're happy that even though it's a Yom Hadin, a day of judgment, it is still a mitzvah to be happy on your holiday because there's a Pasuk that tells us in Tehillim, Tiku b'chodesh shofar b'kesa le'yom chagenu. It's a Pasuk that means that you should blow the shofar when? At the moon's renewal, at the time that we are... Um, of our holiday, of our festival day. V'nemar b'nechemia, and it says, our first source, echlu mashmanim, eat fatty things, you know, rich things, ushtu mamtakim, and sweet things, ki kadosh hayom, because the day is holy ladonenu. V'al ta'atzvu, and don't be sad. Remember something, when you say the day is holy, I have to eat food, the day is holy. Look at the juxtaposition of those two ideas. Hashem made the world. And Hashem made everything in the world. And when you eat the food and you recognize that, and you understand, it's not just stam achila gasa, just eating for the sake of eating, but you're understanding what's going on with food and what's going on with this beautiful atmosphere, you are then tapping into a certain part of a Kaddish Baruch Hu that's extremely important. Are you so yes, we're going to talk about that. What does that mean? We don't do proper tshuva in the sense of vidui. That's going to happen on Yom Kippur. But all of the emotions that are going to prepare you to be able to do tshuva, to get yourself in the mindset, are there. And I would say that that is a big piece of tshuva. Because when a person has an awareness of Hashem in the senses that we're talking about, that's half the problem that we have. That we don't have that awareness. So once you shift into that, you can't say that's not tshuva. So yes and no about the tshuva. So again, the day of Rosh Hashanah is going to be a day when we need to get our minds in focus about who HaKadosh Baruch Hu is. So a lot of things we don't say, but a lot of things we do. We do think many things, okay? So we'll get, we'll go a little bit more into it. The Rambam. Shivat Yimei HaPesach B'Shmonat Yimei HaChag Im Shar Yamim Tovim Kulam Asurim Behesped V'Tanis The Rambam says that the seven days of Pesach and the eight days, all the days of the holidays, and he says, Sha'ar Yamim Tovim. So what other Yamim Tovim are there? Other holidays are Rosh Hashanah. He, he already mentioned Pesach, Shavuos, and Sukkot. Here we're talking about the rest of the holidays refers to our holiday. All of these holidays, you're not allowed to make eulogies, and you're not allowed to fast. V'chayev Adam liyos bahem sameach v'tov lev. A person has to be happy. A person has to have a good feeling in his heart. Who uvanav ishto him, his children, his wife, ubnei beto, the people that live there, and everybody. Shenemar v'samachta b'chagecha, because it says you should be happy on your holidays. Afal pi shehasimcha ha'amurakan he karban shlamim in the days of the beis hamikdash on these holidays. 
a special korban was brought, a special sacrifice was brought. And that sacrifice, you know, generated the true simcha. Now we don't have a Beis HaMikdash. So maybe you could say, okay, we don't have that, so we don't really have such simcha. The Rambam says, no, we do. Because even though we don't have that, yesh bechlal oto simcha. We still have the underlying simcha is still there. L'smachu uvanav uvnei beito kol echad veechad kera'uilo. Every person should be happy, each fitting according to his ways. And if you jump down to the bottom source, I'm going to read you. He, the Rambam explains how are we each one supposed to be happy. He gives like a beautiful illustration of what makes the different categories of people happy. Ketzad. How do we do Simchas Yom Tov? Haktanim, children. See how nice he goes into each category. Children, noten lehem kliyot ve'egozim u'magdanot. We give the children, I guess in his day, this was popular, roasted nuts. I like roasted nuts. I would be happy with that, right? We give them roasted nuts and cakes, all kinds of stuff, food that kids like. Vahanashim and women. You'll tell me if you agree with what he says. I personally do agree with this statement. Konelahem bigadim. We buy them new clothes. There's something about, uh, what do they say? Um, you know. Look good, feel good. <laughs> yeah, you, when you go out and you buy new, you, you buy things, you buy clothes. Most women will get happy to having a new outfit. I mean, it's not the biggest happiness in the world that you could have, right? But it, it does give you. It got retail therapy. That was the word I was looking for. Retail therapy, bitachshit and jewelry, kafim mono as much as you could afford. So a husband has a mitzvah to buy his wife come yantuf time new clothes and jewelry. But he says according to what you could afford. Vanashim and the men, ochlim basar b'shotin yayin. The men, he said, like a good steak and they like to drink wine. She'en simcha el basar. There's no simcha as the kind of simcha with basar. Of course, in the times of the Beis Hamidlash that was talking about karbanos, and here we're talking about different times. And when somebody eats and drinks, he has to remember he's obligated to also feed the convert, the orphan, and the widow. And these are categories in the Torah. These three cases are all cases of vulnerable populations. People who don't have people necessarily fending for them. So the Rambam is telling us, when you have your yantif, it's very nice. You do all these things that I say. You buy your wife new clothes. You get yourself the best roast. You get your kids treats. But your neighbor down the street who doesn't have a place for Shabbos or yantif, you ignore? Oy vavoy. Aval misha no, it's what he says. Misha no el blatot chetzro, somebody who locks his doors. Ve'ochel v'shoteh hu banav ishto. And he eats and he drinks him and his wife. In other words, not interested in any company. I'm not interested in having extra people at my table. I just want to have my family, right? What does the Rambam say? He doesn't give the poor people and he doesn't give those who are bitter souls. People who don't have it so easy. Not a category. It could be anybody. It could be married, single, it could be old, it could be young. Mare nefesh. People who are having a hard time. Ein zo simchat mitzvah. You are not doing the mitzvah. Ela simchat karso. You are making your stomach happy. But you are not doing the mitzvah. Val elu ne'amar. And on these people it says, Zivcheyem kelechem onim lahem. He said, those people, their um, gifts that they give me, to Ashkadosh Baruch are like bread that prosecutes them. Every bite they take just makes Hashem more upset because Hashem is aware that this is selfish bread. It's not the bread of giving. So here we have, a, you know, when the Rambam talks about 
the first source we gave of the Rambam and the others, how you have to have simcha, right? And you have to make yourself a beautiful yantiv. You have to work on making a beautiful yantiv. But also we can't forget the rest of the population, right? Don't think, so it's also very nice. Also notice how in Nehemiah, what was one of the things that he said to the people? Give portions to the people, the rest of the people. Go at, almost sounds like Purim. Right? I'm poor, and what do we do? We give mishlach manot. We create camaraderie. We, we create a good community feeling on Purim by doing the mishlach manot. Guess what? We do the same thing on Rosh Hashanah. You're supposed to do the same thing. The same idea follows through. Okay, so here we saw a lot of different sources about like I said, all the positive, beautiful emotions of Simcha that we're supposed to approach Rosh Hashanah with. On the other hand, we did get a sense a little bit that, you know, we shouldn't go overboard because we have to always have Yirat Hashem, always have that in front of us. We're going to see another source right now, okay? Um, another source right now, uh, look in the Be'er Hetev, which quotes about the Ari, the Ari HaKadosh, who was a Kabbalist, right, many hundreds of years ago, the one who's buried in Sfat. So it was his custom, it's written here, Ari Zal Nahag Livkot Barash Hashanah. Well, guess what? The Ari didn't sit home and wasn't laughing and wasn't doing that. He felt it was incumbent upon the person to cry on Rosh Hashanah of Yom Kippur. He puts them together. The Amar, and he said, Somebody who doesn't cry on these days, there's something wrong with his neshama. His very soul is lacking something. So the Ari felt it's extremely important. Okay? We also know that the Targum explains, and he says he calls Rosh Hashanah, he says it's called Yom Yivava. A day of crying. There are many such sources that talk about this. On one hand, we have this simcha aspect. On the other hand, we have this crying apps, a, 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 aspect. And what I want to say is that I don't think they're really such a contradiction. I think that all of Rosh Hashanah is an opportunity. It's an opportunity, and especially even the shofar. When we talk about the shofar and the mitzvah of the shofar, the shofar is really the sound of raw emotion. That's what it is. It's different kinds of cries. There are some cries that are long wails, and there are some cries that are sobs, right? And there are some cries that are just like little chopped up, broken, gulps and then there are combinations combinations of cries so the shofar is is very powerful intense emotion that leans more into the idea of the crying so what's going on with that crying i heard a very beautiful thought um, from rabbi breidowitz and he said, you know, we say about Rosh Hashanah, we read, Hayom Harat Olam. So many people translate that to mean, today is the birthday of the world. You'll read it in your machzer. But he said, take the word Harat, and you could also get the root for Herayon, pregnancy, conception. Today is the time of the conception of the world, meaning today anything could be decreed for what my new year is going to be like. And that's scary. It could be even that you're going to get the best things in the world, but it's still scary because you don't know how you're going to deal with that change. And so we cry to Hashem because we cry to Hashem in the sense that we throw it on Him as if to say, only you can help us. 
only you will determine this and only you can help us. And that's why it makes sense emotionally for us to be in this place. On one hand, we have every confidence in HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and the Simcha reflects the confidence that we have in God that we're going to have a good year, that we're going to do what we're supposed to do, that we're going to be connected to Him to the best of our abilities, right? We have confidence on that. On the other hand, we are human beings. And when the reality hits us of the enormity, it's a mamish pikuach nefesh. Right? It really is a, it's really a situation of life and death. So a normal person can't react to that with just simcha. Even if they don't actually cry. See, it's like sometimes, you know, the tears come out. Sometimes tears don't come out, but you feel them inside you. That's also crying. A person doesn't have to feel guilty, but I didn't get, you know, tons of water coming out of my eyes. I didn't cry. Maybe you're not a crier. Maybe you've trained yourself over your whole life to be very restrained. But inside you're crying. That's crying. And when a person goes to the place of tears, they're going to a very holy place. You know, it says that the gate of tears is never locked. Did you ever hear that? The gate of tears is sometimes the gates of prayer are locked, but the gates of tears are not locked. It means that those tears are what I would call liquid prayers. <laughs> Right, it sounds funny to say it, but it really is. They're liquid prayers. Hashem knows how to make language out of liquid prayer. Sometimes we don't even know. Why am I crying? What's wrong? You can't articulate it. If someone would ask you, why can't you tell me? You're so emotional about this. Surely you can tell me. And you can't articulate it. But Hashem can. Hashem can. You know, there's a very beautiful story once about a community. I don't remember which rub. It could have been it could have been told about Rabbi Yisrael Salanter, the head of the Musa movement, that this happened to. But one year the the congregation was in the shul and everybody was waiting for the rabbi to come, right? to stay kol nitre, and the rabbi didn't come. Oh, the, no, excuse me. The rabbi did come, but the rabbi said, we can't start yet. People don't know, why can't we start yet? They're waiting and waiting and waiting. Finally, the rabbi says, now we can start. So they said, what happened? Why couldn't we start now? He said there was a little boy who didn't have any cheder training. He didn't know how to read. He didn't come from such a strong background. And he was standing outside the shul. And he felt very bad. He couldn't go in the shul because he didn't know any of the prayers, didn't have a machzer, couldn't read. But he knew one thing. He knew the olive bays. So he was standing outside the shul reciting the olive bays. And he said to Hashem, I don't know the words, but I know the alphabets, and you, Hashem, can do anything. Take all the letters and make them into my prayers. And Hashem did. And then the rabbi said, the boy is finished, now we can start our God. Hashem is busy taking care of this boy's prayers right now, now we can start. Sometimes a prayer that's not even articulated, but it's so deep within you that it's just a strong emotional burst of feeling is very valuable. Very valuable. There's a Gemara that says that anybody that cries for a kosher person, that means not even a Rosh Hashiva, not even a rabbi, not even a Talmud Chacham, a kosher person. Somebody who's a plain, simple, good Jew. It says that Hashem takes those tears and he counts them and he puts them in his special treasure house and he saves them you know what he saves them for 
he will use them to water the graves at the time of Trias HaMesim to make the souls become revived. Why are those tears so precious? Why does it matter? Because it means that when you cried for somebody, right, you felt the lack of another human being. You cried. You felt the godless of a Tzalem Elohim. And those tears are an expression of that feeling. And they become like a tremendous prayer. They're extremely valuable to Hashem. And He saves them in this, in this treasure house. Right? So tears are something very unique. We're also told about tears. That, for example, a man should be very careful that his wife doesn't cry because tears come easily to women. I don't know if that's true about all women, but I know about many women, myself included, right? Tears come easily to women. And they're very emotional and very deep feelings come from tears. So the Gemara warns the husband, be careful. Don't cause your wife to cry because Hashem takes those tears. And it's very important to him that another person shouldn't be in so much pain. Right? And when Hashem sees our pain, He doesn't want us to be in pain. He doesn't want us to be in pain. So He answers us. <coughs> and even I know that you got a lot of classes and that you learned, you know, all the ideas about doing tshuva and, you know, we have to look at all our deeds very, very carefully. But we're in some ways like children. We're like a child. Imagine a little boy. I heard this mashal by Rabbi Shimshim Pinkus Zatzal. He gave this mashal once and he said, imagine a little boy who was in school and he was like the worst, right? One day he got in trouble, he, he beat up a kid and then he took the Rebbe's pencil and he broke it in half, right? And he did so many things that were like troubling. And so when he got home, what did the parents do? They ground him for a month. They said, you're not going to ride on your bike for a whole month. And they said, and there's no ice pops for you for the next week. Blah, 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 right? And the little boy goes into his room and he's very angry. And what does he do? He slams the door. And when he slams the door, he slams it on his finger. And he gives a scream. Imagine, imagine that pain. You know, when you get your finger stuck in a door, you can't even imagine such horrible pain. And it's, and it's terrible. And he screams. And at the moment when the little boy screams that scream, what do the parents do? They scream too. And they run in and they grab that little kid. And they forgot all about the pencil and they forgot all about the fight. And they forgot all about all the reasons why they grounded him. And they right away take him straight to the, to the hospital. And they buy him, they buy on the way, they buy him an, an ice pop and they get a new pencil for the Rebbe or whatever they do, right? Anything, it's just so that their little boy should be okay. It's the same thing with us. A lot of things we do wrong. It's true. We got in trouble. Just like the kids who get in trouble in class. We do get in trouble. But you know what? At the end of the day, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is our parent. And when he sees we're in pain, he's in pain. And all he wants to do is to fix it for us. Rosh Hashanah is an opportunity, a tremendous opportunity to connect to Hashem Baruch Hu. And you're going to be able to connect to Hashem in many ways. Some people connect to Hashem more through creating the simcha and the beauty. Some people connect to Hashem more in the intensity of the moment of the shofar. You know what I mean? And we're all meant to do that, both ways. We're supposed to work on that, we're supposed to get there in that direction. Some people asked, what should you think about when you're, when you're hearing the shofar? My thought is that you should think about, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, take me under your wing. I recognize that you are the king of kings. You are my father, you are my king. I recognize this. I pray for a day when the whole world will recognize it, right? And whatever it is that's wrong with me, some things I don't even understand, help me figure it out. 
work out the letters of Aleph base so that I under, so that it's understandable, right? Because you can do that. You know how to do that. So that's what I think. Many people have written different things you can think during this time, but just take it in. Take it in. The moment of intensity. Take it in and do something with it. I wanted to read you something, a, sto- a little bit of a story about a chauffeur in Auschwitz. Because there was a place and a time, right, when certainly it was extremely dangerous for them to be caught doing something like that. And here is a story about one year on Rosh Hashanah, what happened in the middle of the, of the war. One year on Rosh Hashanah during the Holocaust, a group of fervently religious boys were told that they were about to be cremated alive. The boys approached Rabbi Meislich, who was known to have successfully smuggled a chauffeur into the Auschwitz death camp and asked him to blow it for them so that they could perform one last mitzvah before they died. Indeed, they begged Rabbi Meislich to come to their barracks and blow all 100 chauffeur blasts as is ritually required on the Jewish New Year. Rabbi Meislich didn't know what to do. If he agreed to their request, he would likely be caught and put to death. His own son was begging him not to blow the chauffeur, as if he did not want to become an orphan. The son correctly explained that there was no requirement to put one's life in danger in order to fulfill the mitzvah of blowing the chauffeur. Rabbi Meislich decided to blow the chauffeur. He argued that although his son was right, in that there was no requirement to put one's life in danger in order to fulfill the mitzvah of shofar. He did not expect to live much longer in any case. He'd rather die for performing a mitzvah than just be thrown into the gas chamber in a random roll call. Thus, the rabbi proceeded, shofar in hand, to the boys' barracks. Just as he was about to blow the shofar, however, the boys asked him to hold off and first deliver an inspirational (coughs) sermon. Imagine, the boys were minutes away from death, but they wanted to feel Rosh Hashanah. They wanted to hear the shofar. Rabbi Meislish complied. He began by quoting the verse in the book of Psalms relevant to Rosh Hashanah. Blow the shofar on the new month, at the time of hiding, on the day of our holiday. Of course, the true meaning of at the time of hiding refers to the moon which is hidden on Rosh Hashanah as the holy day takes place on the first day of the lunar month when there is a new moon that cannot be seen. Rabbi Meislish interpreted the verse as referring to their own situation as it (coughs) seemed that God himself was hiding from them. He told the boys to have faith. He then blew the shofar One of the boys stated, let us all acknowledge the great self-sacrifice of the rabbi for coming here to blow the shofar for us. In the merit of this mitzvah, may he be spared and go on to have a long, good and healthy life. Everyone then said, Amen. And as you know, Rabbi Meislis survived and made his way to Chicago. Rabbi Meislis writes that he recorded this story to show that young Jews in Auschwitz were so dedicated to the performance of mitzvot in general and the blowing of the shofar in particular. Thank God we are living in a time that we need not risk our lives to hear the sound of the shofar. But why, why did they want so much to hear that shofar? Because the shofar is the deepest part of us. It's the cry within all of us to want to be connected to Hashem. It's the little voice of longing in you that wants to feel Hashem's arm around you. So much of our lives, we're like feeling lost, abandoned. We're not even sure anybody cares or is listening. Imagine how you would feel if one day Hashem came and He took you and He held you. Hashem is doing that. And the shofar is that little voice in us, that cry in us, that reaches out to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that says, hear us, hear us. And Hashem 
drops everything. Just like the parents that ran and scooped up that boy who hurt his hand. He scoops us up and he takes us close to him. So, like I started out by saying, how are we supposed to feel in Rosh Hashanah? Overwhelmingly, we're supposed to feel happy. But not happy in like a silly way. Happy because we know, we deeply know that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is with us. When you really believe that, when you really have that inside of you, yes, you have reverence because you know how great your father is. But you can be happy. You don't have to be sad. You're not allowed to be sad. Sadness at this time would suggest that you don't quite believe he can really manage it. And the happiness is when we take all those feelings and we say, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, we believe in you. We have confidence in you. We know that you'll have confidence in us. What do we say every morning? We say, Moda'ani lifanecha melechai v'kayam shechazata binishmasi b'chem la rabba emuna secha. We thank Hashem for giving us a new day of life, that He had confidence, that He had faith in us. He gave us another chance and another chance and another chance because he believes in us that we're going to be good children, each in his own way. Not perfect, but each in his own way. Trying. Trying is good enough. And every day when you say Moda'ani, remember that Hashem just gave you a vote of confidence. You're standing here in Rosh Hashanah Hashem gave you this whole year. It means every day of the year He gave you a vote of confidence. And Be'ezrat Hashem, He'll give you another vote of confidence on this new year. He knows what's best for us. He understands us totally, absolutely, and completely. All we have to do is be 100,000% real with Him. Get down to the, to the bare bones. You know, so with that, I just want to wish you all a meaningful yantif, a good yantif, a good din. Hashem should have each one of us inscribed for life and health and the ability to affect other people in a positive way, the ability to do chesed, the ability to love each other, right? Because when Hashem sees that we love each other and we take care of each other, it gives us a lot. It makes everything meaningful. It makes it worth it. Hashem says, you know what? I can't let that person have a hard time. They're doing too much for the world. They're needed. Make yourself needed. You know, and Bezrat Hashem, it should be good for Am Yisrael, and we should have peace, and the Beit HaMikdash, when we really will have the Simcha of the Shlamim and of the Karbanos to make it 100% complete.